landowners who uh, may be interested to learn more about this in the future. And that will save me from bugging you again. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Kearns uh, is a professor and extension specialist, state IPM coordinator and associate department head for the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M University. His current research and outreach emphasis is in pest management and developing IPM programs for cotton, corn, sorghum, soybeans, and insecticide. He leads the extension entomology program for the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M and is the IPM coordinator for Texas. So. The best of the best is here. I'll go ahead and give a, a, a really quick introduction for Dr. Redmond as well. Dr. Larry Redmond is a professor and associate department head for soil and crop sciences. He also manages the endowed Bennett Trust program in the Edwards Plateau, and those programs are held every March or April, just depending on the year, and also every October in Fredericksburg. Dr. Redmond also leads at McKnight 73 Ranch Management University as an intensive four-day event for new or experienced ranchers and landowners to learn more about managing soils, forages, livestock, and wildlife. Uh, Dr. Redmond is in every way a range scientist too. So thank you so much for being on here. Y'all are the best of the best and really appreciate you taking the time during your afternoon uh, for this webinar. Go ahead, Dr. Kearns. All right, thank you very much. Um... So desert termite, also it's uh, <clears throat> known as agricultural termites. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really a, a, a little studied insect species. Uh, there's just not a lot of information or research that's been done on them. And a lot of the, the research mm -hmm. that has been done on them is very, very old. I mean, they're easy to... They're easy to tell what you got. If you if you got these in your hay field or, or your your pasture, uh, it is a termite and it's a subterranean termite and it does build these little mud tunnels, uh, these little casings. And this this is kind of what's going to kick you off to indicate that what you're dealing with are these desert or agricultural termites. Will be these little <clears throat> mud tubules you'll see in your pasture. Of course, this is the termites themselves, <clears throat> and it's just their typical termites is in that they're uh, they have a cast system, so they'll have a queen, they'll have a colony underneath the ground, and uh, they'll have workers and soldiers, and so it's just a typical insect cast uh, for a social type insect. Uh, these things tend the 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 mount or the colonies tend to reside. When temperatures are uh, are are hot, so during the summertime, you know they those colonies tend to reside about two feet below the ground, and then as temperatures cool in the winter, they will recess and they'll go deeper deeper into the into the soil. So getting at them isn't very easy because you know they're they're subterranean. All right, these things primarily feed on dried grass. Uh, they like to eat things like cow patties. Like, like if you've got an infested station of these things and you go, there's cow patties in the field, you're going to probably find them feeding in those cow patties. They'll take the uh, twig off of bark and things like that. Uh, they don't really eat wood, though. Um, you can find, I mean, I think uh, Noel Troxclair, who's on here, sent me some pictures a couple of years ago where they had galleried up and down a wooden fence and they were kind of just taking the edge off that wood, but they really weren't like burrowing into the wood like the termites we get in our homes that can do so much damage. These things uh, you know, preferred to eat on uh, the uh, dead or dried grass, although they can feed on some green grass, uh, they preferentially are going to go after anything that's dried up. Uh, they're cellulose degraders. Uh, as I mentioned, they'll build these those dirt tunnels. They're called cartons or ca castings. And what they'll do, that they'll build that over green grass, and then that green grass is going to die, and then they feed on it as dead grass. So that's that's the main way they actually kill kill uh, green grass. They can really have huge populations. You don't see them under the soil. I mean, you can break open those casings 
and find them crawling around. But, you know, you can have, you know, four 4,000 termites in a cubic meter of soil, and they can actually eat a, a quite a bit of plant material. And this is primarily dried plant material, but like 24 milligrams of plant material per gram of termite each and every day. And how these things cycle is they tend to build up their populations during a wet year. So if you get a lot of rainfall, then you're gonna see a lot of reproduction, the colonies get big, and they usually go unnoticed because we're growing grass. We have a lot of forage out there and they're gonna tend to just, they're gonna be primarily act as decomposers. And they're gonna be eating primarily any kind of uh, grass that's uh, uh, dead or, or decayed or start or underneath anything that's dry, cow patties, whatever, in, in that pasture. And there's gonna be enough material for them there that they're really not gonna impact the green tissue very much because of there's a, a sufficient food source of dried material yeah. for them. However, we get in a dry year, then that green forage is gonna is gonna dissipate. And so that leaves them with less dry forage to feed on. And that's when we're really gonna notice them because we're gonna see the tunnels because there's less grass out there. They're gonna be uh and then that's when they're really going to start maybe targeting the greener grass um, because there, there's not as much dead forage material for them to, for them to feed on. Um, they're ecologically important in converting carbon into nitrogen. Um, I don't, I think Larry is going to go over some of this in more detail, but. Uh, you know, they, they are important, you know, for composters. However, you know, they can remove a lot of uh, the dry material from the soil, and that can promote erosion and, uh, and uh, rainfall infiltration. Just to give you a, just a quick, this is a study that was done out of a thesis uh, of this Bodine in 1973. And looking at where they either sprayed grass, pasture grass, uh, looking at grass forbs, and then the dried litter, they either sprayed it or didn't spray it. And they're looking at the pounds of material that was there. And if you look at the difference here, you know, for just the green grass, um, where they sprayed it, they had 357, almost 358 pounds more of green material. Actually, less forbs, because they're not necessarily going after the forbs, and of course, a reduction in the in the dry litter. Uh, these were significant re differences. So yeah, they can they can actually reduce the material that's in the pasture. And I will point out here where these guys sprayed this, they use chlorine. And if you look at the old literature for managing desert or agricultural termites, chlordane is the go-to product, but they frown upon us using that these days. So they do significantly reduce grass production and grass litter, reduce competition from the grass, and this is why they ended up with more forbs than they ends up promoting, you know, uh, habitat for your weeds to grow. All right, management. There's really very little research on managing this pest. And again, the data is very old. Chlordane is the go-to product. Uh, there is some older extension material suggesting that dragging a harrow over the pasture and then treating it with malathion uh, is a recommended practice. So uh, in 2022, uh, when we, we were dealing with a, a lot of calls for this pest, uh, we decided to conduct a trial and we we did it on a, a pasture up at Hillsboro and it was either harrowed or non-harrowed. And then with each of those areas, we either treated it with an insecticide or we didn't treat it. And so these are the insecticides we looked at. Now, what we wanted to do was I, I went through insecticides that primarily have activity on, on termites. Things like Danacor, which is Coranthinilipro, 
uh, and, and these are things that are, that are labeled in pasture too. Uh, Daifu Bijron, which is, we, we put it on as Unforgiven, uh, and that's a, uh, that's a, uh, an insect IGR, same thing as Demolin. Uh, Intrepid or Methoxyphenicide, and Intrepid's another insect IGR, works a little different from, from this other one. And then we put in malathion because that was the old standard that we saw recommended in some extension materials. And then I want to put in a, a, a commonly used pyrethroid, which is lambda, lambda cyhalothrin, which is a real common pyrethroid use in, in pasture. As I mentioned, what we did, we did harrow over the area. You can see it's pretty darn dry. Yeah, harrow over that, the either harrow it or not harrow it. Uh, and then we uh, looked at our insecticides and then we went through with these little meter square. Uh, and, and within that square, we estimated the amount of tunneling that we could detect. The other thing we did is mm -hmm. we used a imaging device to measure the amount of green material within that area. And we measured that green material using this uh, Canopy app, which just, it just takes the pixel or the image and it breaks it down by pixels and it detects what's green and what's not green. It can give us a, per a percentage of that area that actually had green material in it. Now, first, let's look at what the harrowing did. And so we measured this about two weeks after we, we made application and then three weeks after an application. This is the percent increase in green cover. And so you can see where we harrowed it we actually had less green coverage than when we didn't harrow it. So actually the harrowing was detrimental to the pasture because it's, it, was, it was disrupting its ability to grow. So that's not good. And then if we look at the insecticides again, here this first graph is showing 15 days after treatment. This one's 29 again, about two and uh, four weeks after. So I broke this down. The gray part of this bars are the uh, percent control with harrowing in those plots and the insecticides, the dark part of the bar. We're looking at percent control based on tunnel coverage. And so in your untreated, the only control we got was from the harrowing. Of course, there's no insecticide there. And you can see it's about 18%, 18% control of uh, in reduction in the tunneling. Uh, Vanacore was upwards around 40, Unforgiven about 38, Intrepid about 40, Malathion about 30, but Lambda Cyhalothrin, and that's a, the high rate of that product, was upwards of uh, 97%, which kind of surprised us. Um, we saw the same typical results even a, a month out. So it wasn't like some of these were like, well, they're just gonna take a while to work. Uh, even a month out, the results were very, very similar. So harrowing, there's no statistically significant impact on the termites. 18% uh, was all we got, not statistically different, but it on the bad size, bad side, did tend to slower, slow forage regrowth. There's no benefit. The insecticides, the lambicide halothrin gave us about 97% control for about a month. Now I have, I, I would imagine those termites in the soil, that, that colony is probably still alive. So I'm thinking that what we did is we suppressed them. And so really, I think by using an insecticide like Lambda, uh, about the only benefit you'll get is suppression. You'll get really good control for at least a month. But the idea there is to, with hopefully with some rainfall, you might get some forage regrowth. 
and it'll keep the termites off them. But I, I'm not convinced that we would see like very long term control using uh, any of these products, but particularly a pyrethroid. Keep in mind, no insect, desert termite or ag termite is not on any insecticide label. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't use the insecticide. If that, if that insecticide is labeled on that pasture in that crop, you can still use it. Uh, you, you don't want to make written recommendations, but you can make verbal recommendations of that product. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Looking at the chat here, it says, what did they spray with? Uh, in, in the 1970s trial, it was chlordane. And I don't, um, unless you kept some from way back, you're not gonna be able to get any of that. Um, do we know the range, distribution desert termite in Texas? It, it's, it has a very, very broad range. Uh, all the way from East Texas through uh, through uh, the western part of the state, so and you know it's it's all the way into uh, Arizona. It's a pest there. What's the cost of the insecticide treatments per acre? Well, I think Lambicide Halothra is about it's about four dollars an acre, three or four dollars an acre. It's not expensive. It's it's I put it in there mostly because it's the cheapest. And it's uh it's it's gonna be cheaper than any of those other, I wouldn't recommend any of the other ones and none of them work. But uh Vanacore is gonna be expensive. We use the high rates. Um, but the uh the Lambda Sahelter is is a fairly inexpensive pyrethroid. There are a ton of generics of that out there. Is there a threshold to spray? Not unfortunately, no. Um I think it would be very hard to 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 develop a threshold, it, it usually takes years and years of data to generate a threshold. And with the conditions, uh, there's so many environmental factors that would influence whether or not it's gonna be a value. And I think maybe Larry can address some of the value of this uh, to spray that it's really just a judgment call. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Kearns? Okay, one more came in, sir. What is the um, best? This is what, what's the timing of application? Is there a recommended, recommended wait time for reapplication? Uh, you know, I don't, we just, it was a bad situation when we got in there, but there was still green forage left, right? I mean, if, if there's nothing left, yeah, I don't know if it's even worth spraying, but there was enough forage there that, I think it justified treating to try to protect it. Um, as far as coming back and reapplying, I think the way I would judge that is just on new, you know, new tunnel development. And if you're seeing significant new tunnel development, you know, it might justify another application. Collateral damage on beneficials if you spray. Well, pyrethroid is pretty broad spectrum. Um, and so you'll have some collateral damage, and I should have brought this up. Fire ants love to eat these termites. So if you're in an area that's got termite, uh, fire ants, they'll definitely prey on them. Uh, but, the, you know, those mud tunnels do protect them. And, of course, the termites will fight the ants, the, the uh, soldier termites. But um, I think it's a uh, uh, good – it's it, – there's no other choice that I can see than using a pyrethroid. It's the same, you know, Lambda Sihalothrin is, is used a lot in pasture, particularly for like fall armyworm control. Uh, I would like to have something that was less disruptive, but it's really the only choice we got. And on that note of collateral damage too, there was a, an, another question that came up about horde, Texas horn lizards um, and their babies. Um, is that? I, you know, I doubt it would have much impact on those. Um, land, land saw hail, the parethroids are, as far as mammalian and, and vertebrate toxicity, they're pretty low tox. Okay. Uh, they're just really active on insects. Okay. 
Well, good. Well, uh, Dr. Kearns, we'll go ahead and transition to Dr. Redmond. Um, there may have been one more that came up in the chat box. Aerial applications effective, best way to broadcast on large or small acres, Dr. Kearns. Yeah, you know, uh, I can't because we didn't do aerial. You know, we, we put this all on by hand with the with the boom, which would simulate a ground application rig. Um, but I think aerial would be fine. Um, I, I, I think you'd be best. I think a little bit, uh, the thing you'd want to watch is your gallons per acre. You know, if you're just going out at two gallons per acre, you know, it might, that, I, that might have an impact, but I really, I really don't know. I, you know, if you could get it up to five, that would probably be good. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kearns. We'll go ahead and transition to Dr. Redmond, who is an expert at bringing all things together. In fact, um, you're going to start <laughs> turning me down when I ask you to speak because you're my pull it together uh, type of speaker. So uh, please go yeah. ahead whenever you're ready, Dr. Redmond. But I depend so heavily on you. <laughs> uh, so can you see my screen or not? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. We got your slides up. Everything looks good. All right. I like that shirt. That's a good Friday shirt. Hey, it's Tropical Friday. So <laughs> anyway. Uh, and David did such a great job of covering everything. What I have is mostly going to be uh, just repetitive, but I may have just a little different slant as we get near the, the end there. So let's see if we can get this thing to work. All right. So David has has gone over this. He's, he's made mention that he only removes surface materials. It's not like the subterranean termites that get into our houses so we don't have to worry about that part of it. But the thing that bothers me is this last statement there that they can, can completely denude large areas. I remember it's been over 35 years ago now, was in South Texas, and we looked at some, some rangeland down there that literally didn't have any forage left on it. It was completely denuded, and it was the desert termites. And that's the first time I had ever seen that extensive damage uh, done to rangelands, but it, it was pretty significant. And so, you, you know, that's the thing, I'm, I'm drawing here on some things that I, I read in some other um, articles and, and publications, but when we're talking about the number of termites, I mean, David gave you a number of a cubic meter, I think, well, I'm giving you a number per acre. And what that equilibrates to or equals to is like having additional animal units out on the pasture. And, and that's the problem that I have with it because there's, there's just so many mouths that we can put out there on the rangeland and get away with it, especially during dry weather, which we seem to be having more and more of that. But, you know, when you've got an average of one animal unit to 15 or one animal unit to five, that's a pretty heavy stocking rate, additional stocking rate that you're putting out there. So uh, the things that we know about them, and again, Dr. Kearns has covered this, consumption of standing forage, but they also have the ability to uh, directly destroy the pasture and rangeland plants. And that's when we start to get in not only trouble with our, our livestock, but can also have an impact on some uh, wildlife species as well. They will consume a, a, a lot of the uh, dry grass and the mulch. In fact, some of the places I read that the mulch disappearance, it could be up to 50 or 55 percent, could be attributed to the desert termites. And again, if you have these denuded areas, and you do get a rainfall event, then you have a tremendous uh, volume and, uh, and velocity of overland flow of that water with nothing there to impede. And so that leads to increased erosion, which can, over time, lead to the desertification. And that's, that's something we'd like to avoid. So there might be some positive attributes. And I, and I put that in question marks because I think that the jury may still be out on, on what we think is, is positive. There are some things that we know about that. Uh, the, there's one, one paper I looked at said that they improve precipitation infiltration. Now, uh, Eckert 
uh, when they published their paper back in 75, they said that was not what they saw on short grass prairie up in the panhandle. So they saw just the opposite of that. It said it, there was uh, increased runoff on those sites where they had the desert termites. There's some indication that they can improve nutrient cycling. I think that's, that's probably uh, something that we could maybe uh, agree to because they, they are taking uh, organic matter decompose or, you know, mineralizing that as it goes through their digestive system. One of the things I thought was interesting is that they actually farm fungus is what I read on which they can feed also. And, and this fungus that increase uh, organic matter in the soil can, uh, you know, improve soil fertility and structure. And then consuming the animal feces. David mentioned that about consuming the dung pads. And I think that's always a positive thing if we can you know, recycle that material, get that back into the soil. Now, the negative aspects, uh, in my mind, far outweigh the positive, and, and I may be wrong on that. Somebody could probably argue me uh, into believing the other, but where I stand today, I think the consumption of these plants that would be grazed by livestock or wildlife, is a, it, that's a tremendous negative for me. Uh, on rangeland, we typically have enough trouble just you know, having the forage and having the stocking rate right anyway, we don't need other negative things happening out there that removes the forage plants uh, that we're dependent on. There Again, I mentioned the direct destruction of forage plants, consumption of the dry grass, all that. We talked about the, the runoff. But this is where I, I listened the other day and was uh, impacted by Daryl and Dale Rollins' uh, podcast and Darryl, uh, uh, um, Dale was very uh, insistent that these things can have a tremendous negative impact on ground nesting bird habitat, that is, uh, quail habitat. And so, you know, on ranches where this is an important source of revenue, uh, that can have a tremendous detrimental impact to the ranch revenue. And then again, during dry years, when we have limited forage production already, this is the, I think, the take-home message here is that in some years, proper use of the rangeland will be impossible. And so without destocking or reduced stocking, uh, when you start to see these things taking place, and it's going to start taking place typically in, uh, you know, late spring as the weather starts warming up, you get into summer, that's where we're going to start seeing those cartons out there on the grass plants. And when we see that, we need to understand if, if that impact is just small, if it's just a, a small spot over here in one pasture or so, then maybe it's not a big deal. But if we start seeing these larger areas that are being impacted, we need to make some adjustments in our stocking rate because it, to not do that leads into worse problems on our rangeland. I mean, not, not even counting the reduced production by the livestock or wildlife. But then we're going to be buying more things off farm to try to feed them and get them through the drought. And we all know you can lose a ranch trying to feed your way out of a drought. Uh, this is just a, a picture that shows uh, this is on buffalo grass stolens. And so you can see that buffalo grass stolen is going to be in trouble. And this is on Bermuda grass. And so they'll take almost any plant species. I noticed in uh, Ecker. Uh, their publication from 1975 that they said that they liked uh, red three on and buffalo grass and blue grama and they prefer blue grama. Well, that's a preferred livestock forage and we don't need our termites getting out there on our blue grama. And so coming back to negative attributes, the thing I want to just really emphasize is that during these dry years, and we've had plenty of them back to back to back, if you've got problems with desert termites, you've got to pay attention because you can get in trouble on the rangeland real quick, like uh, not only with the plant species out there and the production and, and all that, but livestock performance is going to suffer, wildlife can suffer. Uh, and so we just really have to pay close attention uh, to our stocking rate during those dry years when we've got the desert termite out there. And, you know, a few things that uh, I pulled from. Uh, David mentioned, uh, I don't know if it's Bodine, Bodine, I don't know what it is, but Eckert, uh, that was a result of a three-year study up there uh, outside of Texas Tech. They were up there in Shortgrass Prairie in the, in the 
High Plains. Allison McDonald and some others have published a, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty nice publication talking about desert termites. I don't think they have a whole lot of data in there, uh, but but they they do talk a lot about the life cycle and that sort of thing. And then there's some things out of Oklahoma State. So uh, with that, I'm going to hush and and let the the crowd ask Dr. Kearns all the questions that he wants wants to add, answer for them. There you go. That's that's a good way to end. Thank you, Dr. Redmond. Great slides and awesome way to bring it all together. You can see the big picture in all things. There were a few questions that came in the chat box, so we'll just kind of let you all pick and choose. Uh, Dr. Rollins, of course, asked, do cow pies act as food plots for termites? I don't know if that's a genuine question, but I thought it was kind of cute. Well, I, I think based <laughs> on what uh, Daryl Eckert and, and many others, I mean, I'm looking here in this rangeland entomology book here. And there's a lot of other sources uh, that have looked at that and said, yes, they absolutely do consume, uh, you know, dung pats and that sort of thing. So, it, and that's part of the, the nutrient cycling. So I think, you know, that's one of the positive things that we can say about them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Smith also asked, has any of these studies compared termite impact of different range conditions? Poor or fair range condition is typically caused by historical bad range management. Good to excellent condition are typically more resistant. What do you... What are your thoughts there, Dr. Edmund? I, I think no, because uh, like Kern said earlier, there's not been a lot of studies uh, on, on desert termites. The, most of the studies that I've read about have been conducted in Africa or Australia, places like that. We've not had a lot of studies uh, in Texas other than what uh, Eckert did back in the 70s. Um, so we can't answer that question. I mean, that would be a great... It, you know, if you had a scenario where you could actually stage those things and and, and then introduce the desert termite on cue uh, so that they could go in there and you could see what the results might be on excellent versus poor, I think that would be interesting. But no, we don't have that, that information. I think, too, a little bit of that question is also what we see, right? When rangeland is in poor condition or we have a lot of bare ground, you're going to notice termites way more than you did in something that was maybe in a good to excellent condition class. So, um, but, but good point. Another question that came up, Mr. Conaway, are there any native or improved grasses that are resistant to them? And when he says improved, he means, you know, introduced, Dr. <laughs> They're not necessarily improved, are they? I was not going to point that out <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I don't, I don't know uh, of any. Dr. Kearns may uh, have seen something, but I don't know of any that would be resistant. I mean, it's kind of like the the Bermuda grass stem maggots. You know, they seem to like finer textured leaves versus the broader. But I don't know that the desert termite has that much uh, ability to choose or inclination to choose. Yeah, there could be some of those comparisons in the species um, that e Dr. Eckert mentioned, you know, purple three on very fine stem, kind of a rolled, rolled stem. So maybe maybe there's something there for future research um, gung ho people. Uh, yes, Dr. Rollins, I seem to prefer finer stem grasses from the Budalua's. OK, versus old world blue stems or um, improved. Thank you, sir. Golly, this is fun. We should have these types of webinars every Friday, right? Any other questions for Dr. Kearns, Dr. Redmond, Dr. Rollins, Dr. Eckert? Okay. They love Klein grass, Brad, yes. Good. Good to, good to have you on here, Brad. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Steffens, what are natural predators of termites? Uh, we mentioned earlier Texas horned lizards, I think, maybe. It seems that we may need to be concentrating on that aspect. Yeah, getting some balance back into the system. Uh, Dr. Redmond, Dr. Kearns, any thoughts there? Well, as I mentioned, fire ants and probably some other ants, are, they're very good predators of uh, these termites. Um but like with a lot of lot of other termite species, you know, they they protect themselves. They they actively protect their colony. So they're gonna work to keep predators away. And so the, they're mostly only exposed 
on the surface and not and when they're not in a, a tube. So you'd have to break that tube open. So <clears throat> that 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 does a lot to protect them. You know, the thing that that might be really interesting would be uh, looking at some uh, nematodes, something you can get in the soil that maybe you can really go after their their immatures and uh, maybe have some impact there. Dr. Kearns, are, are termites at all susceptible to extreme temperatures on the soil surface? I find it ironic that they're creating bare ground, but they're also essentially creating a hotter surface. Can they cook? If they're well, I would, I'm sure at some point they do. What, what that temperature is, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. May I, may, may I make a comment? Of course. So I was trying to do some work with the desert termite in Uvalde County in a, in a hay field. And one of the things I noted was uh, I, I went out when it was like oh, 104 degrees in the, in the afternoon and there was no termite in those tubes. But then about uh, 7, 30, 8 o'clock, they started moving up in those tubes as it cooled down and the sun was going away. Uh, the other thing that I noticed was right next to this hay field was a, a wheat field that had been harvested and they didn't do anything with that stubble for, well, till the following spring. But the desert termites never attacked that stubble, uh, even though it was dry. So I think some soil disturbance affects, uh, obviously it would, the, the colonies. I wonder how long it would take, say for something that was in, uh, uh, CRP uh, to see desert termites pop up in there. Yeah, good point, Snow. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we had a few comments come in back into the chat box. We seem to be having a real comeback for red harvester ants. Hopefully they will help. Dr. Rollins mentioned that there is a food bonanza for quail, but rarely see termites in the crop context. Um, quail are missing the boat. Yes, sir. And then Brad also finished things up, but they go out of the tunnels during the day and feed in tunnels at night and early morning, cooler temperatures. So good observations, guys. Well, Dr. Kearns, Dr. Redmond, any um, last minute thoughts, take home messages, key conclusions you want to leave our crowd with before we sign off? I think I may change my name and move to another state. Uh, <laughs> after this pitiful presentation performance. But anyway, Maureen, thank you always. Uh, you know, I depend on you so much for our programming, and I would never say no to you for anything, <laughs> even something so far out of my uh, ability to contribute. But, well, but thank you. When we start talking about bioengineers, I need to have a, a range, a guy that appreciates the range and the content. <laughs> So you did an excellent job. Thank you. And Dr. Kearns, thank you so much for your expertise. Um, the last minute I want to leave everybody with is this was producer requested. So this request came from a, a, a gentleman who hit me up saying I needed a webinar on this in 2023. I didn't get it done, but I'll be dang if I was going to let another year go by without knocking this one out. So um, if you or any of your producers or colleagues have these types of requests where we can bring in a, um, our expert speakers for a quick panel, a quick Q&A in a timely fashion and deliver that information in a meaningful way, let's get her done and, and get that information out there. So thank you for participating. Thank you for your time. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Um, and thank you again. Thank you.